Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We are going to wait a few minutes to get started as more attendees come in. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today for the presentation on finding funding and research opportunities in Europe. Uh, here's a quick reminder that the webinar will be recorded and shared later, so you're able to view an archived video. Uh, today's presentations are open to all, and we've put this together in conjunction with AFRISNET, so we give a warm welcome to the AFRISNET members uh, tuning in in the audience today and all other researchers. Uh, and then before we start, I'd also like to mention that we've reviewed your registration responses to get an idea for what the audience demographics are. Um, and those were optional questions, but this way we'll, we were able to tailor slightly our presentation to sort of meet your needs as a group. Uh, we'll keep that in mind in the presentations. Uh, and then to get a sense for the attendees here today, um, I know not everyone's able to join, so we will wait a few moments, but I'll be launching a, a very brief poll with a couple quick questions uh, to get an even better sense of, of the attendees uh, who are connecting now. Uh, so I'll get to those, those three brief polls in just a moment. Uh, I do wanna give a quick minute for, for some more people to come in, but again, thank you very much. Um, at, at this point, I just want to mention that the, the, out of the five people you see here, it's three organizations represented. Uh, so this is this has been organized in conjunction between all three of us. So two of us here are Euraxis North America. Uh, you'll you'll hear a lot about that during my portion of the presentation. Uh, the German Academic Exchange Service will be presenting specifically on Germany as a research landscape. So while I'll be giving an over overall overarching presentation on Europe and the European research area as a research destination, you'll get country specific country level expertise uh, on Germany. And then I think a large majority of the attendees today are AFRISNET members. Uh, so you don't need to, to hear too much about that. You're very well aware of what the organization does. Uh, and we have uh, them moderating and, and giving welcome remarks. So I will wait just another minute or so but I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, whether you're tuning in by phone or by computer uh, on, on your web browser, you should notice that there is a questions feature. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that a, a bit later, but do have your questions ready so that once uh, we're able to, to wrap up our presentations, we can address those during the Q&A. Uh, if you're on the app, you may have to swipe different portions of your screen to go back and forth between screen sharing when we are sharing our screens and giving our PowerPoint presentations and showing our websites uh, and the questions box, for example, and then the, the video chat box. So just keep in mind that the interface is not always intuitive, but uh, everything should be should be accessible at one point or another. So with that, I will jump into the polls. I think now is a great time to do that. Uh, more people will be jumping in in the next five or 10 minutes regardless, but this is just to get a sense for how everyone's tuning in. So the first question I'd like to ask is, how are you watching today's webinar? And it's gonna be one or the other, either by your smartphone or via computer. And with this, if we see that a large majority of attendees are, are tuning in via smartphone, and if you're coming in by tablet, you can also just answer with the smartphone there. Uh, basically, this will help us realize that your screen is on the smaller side so that we shouldn't be showing presentations with a lot of really small text. Uh, that said, like I mentioned before, the webinar is being recorded. So you'll be able to view this on your own time later, zoom in on the video, view it on a computer. Um, I'll leave this open for just a short moment. It actually looks quite varied. Uh, last week, we had a similar presentation on France as a research destination, and it was much more skewed towards a smartphone connection. Uh, so with this, it's almost 50-50. And I see two thirds of, of the attendees have voted. I will ask that that remaining third just gives a quick answer here. And I'll close out in a second. Okay, so I'm gonna share the results. You should see this on your screen. Uh, basically a 50-50 split between smartphone and computers, that's really useful to know. And I didn't want to ask that previously during the, the pre-registration questions, just because you don't necessarily know what device you'll be connecting on several days in advance. Uh, okay, so with that, I'm going to jump to the next question. What's the next degree step you are considering? Uh, so regardless of if you're currently in a degree program uh, or you're, you're not in a, a degree program right now, but you know what the next step for you would be, we're just curious if that's going to be a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD, a postdoc, or something else. And if it's something else, uh, you're welcome to connect with us by email afterwards, explain a little more detail, and we'll see maybe how we can tailor some information for you. I have about a third of the audience tuning in, or, or rather sharing their vote, so thank you for that. We'll wait just a minute so we can get a majority of responses in. And after this, it'll be just one more quick poll question and we'll, we'll jump into introductions.
Okay, so we have about two thirds of the attendees in response right now. Another even split, so I'll share these results. Uh, about one tenth postdoc, and then the remainder almost exclusively between masters and PhDs. Uh, so that's very useful to know. I'll jump to the next final poll. Okay, so given your current research, work, or job search, uh, ideally, when would you want to transition to a position in Europe? Uh, and if you already have a position in Europe, I know some people are tuning in from various European countries. Uh, obviously, this question would just be your next position in Europe. So I know some folks are potentially ready as soon as, as a university or research institute has an offer for them. Uh, I think for a lot of you, you, you'd like to finish your current program. So therefore, that could be uh, one semester, one year. Uh, but just to get a varied response, I'd like to know, is it more immediately in the next half year, year, two to three years, or four or more years? And just between those, those five different options, uh, that will help us plan long term. And if, if you're not immediately looking uh, to make that move or find that relationship with an institution, obviously a lot of the information that we'll present to you today uh, is more of a, a sort of holistic toolkit to help you think about where you can be in a few years from now. So there's no wrong answer here. I have just about half of you responding. I'll wait another moment and we'll jump into the, the introductions. And again, this is a very subjective question, so feel free to put whatever you think might be the, the most relevant response. Okay, so with that, once I have two thirds of the attendees responding, I think I'll jump right into sharing that final poll and then we can begin the introductions. Okay, and let me share the results here. 15% immediately, 8% in about six months, a majority uh, or uh, majority of the respondents in about one year, 27% uh, in two to three years, and 8% in four or more years. So it's quite varied. That'll be useful to know so that we don't present a, a very skewed uh, sort of singular answer. We understand there's a lot of different, different realities here. Uh, so with that, let me hide these results. And I'd now like to introduce Dr. Daniel Schwab from Afrismet to introduce himself and set the stage for today's webinar. Daniel. So I'll just okay. quickly check on uh, that. So thank you for organizing this webinar, myself and all those on the uh, sorry about that. And to all those on, on the line today, um, to include our AfrasNet students and the broader research community. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, and I recognize a number of names from those of you who are currently in the attendees pool, uh, my name is Dr. Daniel Schwab, and I'm the chair of the Education Committee for AfrasNet, Africa STEM Network, um, where I do a number of tasks, including planning and executing our professional development and uh, research proficiency work. Um, so AfrasNet is built on one goal, as I think most of you on the line know today, which is to advance African participation in global and cutting edge. STEM research. And that goal is built on one set of observations, which is that African excellence in science and technology exists, that it's underutilized and underrecognized by the global community, and that excellence must be made uh, an imminent feature of the science and tech ecosystem, both at home for our students uh, and on the world stage for society. Uh, and so we find it essential to highlight opportunities that could be critical to the growth and well-being of our students. And that is where I think uh, that our speakers on German and EU opportunities come in today. Um, so once again, I thank our speakers, and I hope that all of you who are listening will take full advantage of this opportunity, take good notes, uh, and ask plenty of questions. Um, with that, I'll now turn it over to Alex Kwachi, an AfrasNet student um, who will be our moderator for today. Thank you, Daniel. Um... And welcome um, everyone to this to this webinar. I'm Alex, and I'm from Ghana. Um, currently, I'm a PhD student in genetics at Stony Brook University. Um, I'm a member of the Opportunities Team for AfrisNet. Um, before I introduce the speakers for today, I want to state that the contents for the Iraqis presentation in today's webinar and last week's webinar will be the same. So unless you want to hear specifics about um, the um, German um, research landscape, you don't need to stay um, after the, Iraq, um, the German, um, you don't need to stay um, to the end. Uh, and unless you want to actually um, 
stay through to the um, Q and A um, section. With that in mind, I want to encourage everyone to um, drop in questions um, after each speaker so that um, we will address as much um, as many questions as um, we can at the end. With that said, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Anya Benjostov. Anya is with the German Academic Exchange Service. She is the program officer in charge of master's and PhD scholarships in Germany at the DAD um, Regional Office for Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, so welcome, um, Anya. Thank you. So you, that means I jumped into my presentation, yeah? Yeah, whenever you're ready, yep. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, um, also for me, a very warm welcome and good evening here from Nairobi. It's already uh, after 7 p.m. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity to join you today and to say welcome or willkommen, as we say in German to my presentation on research and funding opportunities in Germany. Um, one second. Okay. Um, to present to you what our DED information menu will hold for you today, First of all, I'm not assuming that simply every one of you knows what DED is or what it stands for. So my first um, task tonight will be to tell you DED, who are we? Then uh, since some of you have specifically requested for that, I would like to introduce you to DED funding for master courses in Germany before we uh, move on to um, a small introduction to the German research landscape for those who would wish to or consider to do research in Germany. And for research in Germany, of course, you need funding. And this is also where the DED can come in. So I will going to present DED funding opportunities for PhD studies in Germany. Before I will wind up my presentation uh, with um, a topic that is very crucial for PhD studies, the supervisor. And uh, that is usually a very elusive individual and I want to shatter that belief and I want to explain to you how um, this elusive individual can actually track down, can actually be tracked down and convinced. So the DED or the German Academic Exchange Service is a self-governing organization of German universities. That basically means the DED or DAT is an umbrella organization of the German universities. So we are representatives of the German universities abroad. So we have about 242 member universities all across Germany and 104 student bodies. And the main goals or mandates of DED are three. So first of all, we are offering scholarships for the best and that's why we are talking to you tonight. Then we offer expertise for academic collaboration that is between German universities and research institutes and those outside Germany. So not just in Africa, but all over the world. And thirdly, we offer structures for internationalization. This is a goal that targets more the German universities and research institutes. Uh, we help them in their quest to attract researchers and students from outside Germany to internationalize their own outlook. Uh, just a few numbers, not too many, I don't want to overwhelm you, but um, just to give you an idea of uh, what it means to be the largest scholarship organization in the world. Between 1950 and last year, this is almost uh, 70 years, the DED has funded uh, German uh, students, researchers and artists um, to go abroad to study and do research. And this number is 1.5, more than 1.5 million. In return, the DED has funded more than 1 million um, researchers and students and artists from outside Germany, from all over the world. 
in their quests, uh, not only in Germany, but also in their respective regions. If we break these numbers down to only last year, to 2019, and if you look on uh, at only Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see here that 6,836 Sub-Saharan Africans were funded for research or studies in Germany or in the Sub-Saharan Africa region. So this number is three times the number of Germans who at the same time were funded by DED for the same purposes to do research or studies in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is 2,380. So in total, these are 9,000 plus uh, individuals. So talking about scholarships and money, um, the DED funding for master courses in Germany comprises basically uh, of two scholarship programs. The first one is called Development Related Postgraduate Courses, or APOS. The acronym um, derives from the German uh, name of this program. And it contains uh, an odd 40 mainly master courses. A few, two or three are also PhD courses in the fields of agriculture, engineering, public health, environmental sciences, regional planning, social sciences, and so on. And it targets young professionals. Young professionals means people who have a first degree and at least two years work experience from developing countries who are either working uh, in a public authority or a state or private company um, who wish to um, pursue a master's degree that is based on their first degree and your, their work experience. So this program neither targets fresh graduates nor target uh, applicants who wish to um, change their careers. So the master's course that you select from the field of the 40 plus courses uh, needs to be based on what you have already done in your first degree and what you have gained work experience in. As a general rule for all DED scholarships, your previous degree, so when you want to do a master's degree, your bachelor's degree, or your last degree should not be older than six years, ideally, at the time of your scholarship application. That is a general requirement for all scholarships, also for the PhD scholarships. So the applications for the APOS program are submitted directly to the university that offers the course in question both for the intake and the scholarship. So you're applying with the same set of documents for the scholarship and the intake in the course at the same time. Details about the courses you can find on the uh, website that I have given you at the bottom of the slide. The second uh, scholarship program is the Helmut Schmidt program. This contains already also pre-selected master courses, eight in this case, in the field of public policy and good governance. Naming this program Helmut Schmidt program already gives you an indication of that. So Helmut Schmidt, in case you don't know, was uh, a German chancellor at some point. So this program, uh, scholarship program, is designed to academically qualify future leaders in politics, law, economics and administration. I know most, if not all of you, are from the STEM fields, but I want to introduce this program anyway because he, this one does not require previous work experience and it is open to people from all fields. So even if you have a degree in molecular biology and you feel with your skills, you also want to contribute to, um, uh, to an, the economic or social development in your home country, this master courses are basically open for you. Yeah. So um, they are open for young graduates from developing countries with a very good first degree, who, as I said, in the future want to actively contribute to the development in their home countries. These eight master courses are also explained in the uh, link that I have given at the bottom of the slide. All these courses have an, a, a joint deadline, so to say, which is July 31st. Uh, the courses in the APOS program have the deadline set by the respective universities, but the Helmut Schmidt program also um, uh, provides that you apply to the universities directly, both for the intake and the scholarship. 
So the scholarship, what does it actually entails? What does what is the value of it? It uh, contains of a monthly stipend of 850 euros, a health insurance cover for the time you spend in Germany, a travel allowance to um, Germany and back to your home country after you have completed your degree, and a German language course prior to the start of your master's course of a varied uh, length. Um, most of these courses, if not all, are, are taught in English. Yeah, so these are courses which are uh, which are intended to attract an international audience, an international uh, um, studentship, so to say. Um, so the majority are in English. Some are very few are taught in German, and then there are others who are taught both in English and German. So those who are taught in German obviously require, as a requirement for the application, a certain level of German. What level that is, is this in the description of the course. So, over to the German research landscapes. Um, Germany, um, and this is uh, supposed to impress you, Germany spends more than 3% of its GDP on research and development. I know this is uh, a number that um, is high in comparison to many other countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this 3.07% of GDP translates to around 100 billion euros per year. Yeah. At the same time, 686 plus people are working in the research and development sector in Germany. And this sector has cooperations with 158 uh, countries all over the world. The research sector in Germany is very interested and depends on international researchers and in, in attracting them to work and do research in Germany. At the moment, there are 121,100 international researchers uh, active in Germany. 47 plus thousand of them are academic staff members at universities. An additional 11,800 are academic staff members at non-university research institutions. And then there are also guest, guest researchers who spend a limited period of time in Germany to carry out research. And these are another uh, 38,000 plus at the moment. The pillars of the German research sector, these are three. First of all, and obviously, these are the universities. Then we have the non-university research institutes and we have the industrial research. If you want to pursue a PhD, um, the first two are your main targets. Um, approximately 400 universities exist in Germany, of which 156 are authorized to confer doctorates. So these 156 are your target uh, destinations. Um, at the, any given time, almost uh, approximately 28,000 international doctoral candidates are enrolled at universities uh, for their degrees, so that means um, the, in, the environment is definitely international. When it comes to the non-university research um, institutions, we have four big research associations, which consist of um, an, a network of institutes under the umbrella of these associations or societies, which I briefly want to introduce to you. This is it is important for you that if you want to do research in Germany, that you at least have heard those names before and can remember what approximately they are doing. So the first one is the Max Planck Society. Uh, it consists of 86 institutes, which um, are all over Germany. And um, the um, particular interesting uh, feature of them of the Max Planck Society is that 52, so more than half of their researchers are from outside Germany. So the Max Planck, uh, so the Max Planck Society focuses on natural and life sciences. So that's why this uh, association is particularly interesting to you. It carries out, carries out basic research in all scientific fields and is very interdisciplinary oriented and has since 1948 uh, produced 18 Nobel laureates. Uh, the website you can see, uh, MPG, 
www.leibniz.de. The Leibniz Association, as much as it focuses on in its research on social sciences and humanities, it does not include anything else. Yeah. So um, it tries to investigate socially, economically, and ecologically relevant issues in the natural sciences, in engineering, environmental sciences, and so on, what you can see here with the focus on a social science and humanities aspect. So um, the Leibniz minus Gemeinschaft.de is the website where you can find much more information on the work that they do in the individual institutes all over Germany. The Helmholtz Association is uh, as much as it has only 19 research centers. It is, however, the largest in uh, terms of its resources, as you can see here. It has 4.7 billion euros as an annual budget and also the largest in terms of researchers. So over 40,000 staff members work in these 19 research centers. Um, the research is intended to solve the grand challenges of society, science and industry. I know these are big words, um, but for the sake of an introduction, uh, I at least want to give you a feel of it. Please uh, always go to the websites of these uh, associations to find out more and also to assess whether whatever research idea you may have fits in any of these institutes uh, and where you could find your home uh, in terms of research. And last but not least is the Fraunhofer Society. Now this uh, research network focuses on applied uh, research. Yeah? It has 72 institutes and an annual budget of 2.6 billion euros. Um, it focuses also on health, safety, communication, mobility, and uh, the website is fraunhofer.de. Um, I don't know whether you have noticed, but the names of these uh, research networks, um, they are all named after scientists and they are all named after male scientists. Now you could say maybe that was the Times, you know, you see uh, they are, most of them were founded shortly after the Second World War. But unfortunately, this naming um, policy also applies to most of the German universities. This is something that has, of course, come to the attention of uh, students and researchers in Germany. And I think in this day and age, um, the German research landscape and universities have a little bit of catching up to do. And if a university or research institute would be named today, I'm pretty sure it would be named after a female scientist, and I think they very much deserve that. Uh, the third pillar of research in Germany is the industrial research. The vast uh, majority of funds, 69%, uh, comes and goes into the industrial research. Um, the innovation drivers in Germany, uh, in the industry, you can see on this slide, Obviously, the largest one are in pharmaceuticals, the pharmaceutical industry with 20% uh, of expenditures, followed by electronics, metrology and optics, then the automotive engineering uh, and automotive related industry and electri electrical engineering are pretty much on the same level. Um, Nine, nine German corporations um, find themselves within the top 20 European innovation drivers. You see their logos here. I'm sure none of them are really a surprise or uh, unknown to you. You see BMW, Volkswagen, as the automotive engineering companies, uh, Böhringer Ingelheim, <coughs> sorry, Ingelheim and Bayer as pharmaceutical companies. So again, this is, supposed to be an introduction. It's supposed to uh, give you names that you can then take and Google and search for details later on. So now I have introduced all these uh, beautiful um, research institutions to you. Now, how do you get the money to study there? Um, first of all, in Germany, it is important to know that there are two ways to do a PhD. 
One way is the structured PhD, which is, I'm very sure, uh, very familiar to you. Uh, you join a structured PhD program at a university. You have classwork, coursework together with other students. And then time is set aside for your research. Everything pretty laid out for you. And uh, in contrast to this, um, there is the individual PhD path or the pure research PhD, which is the traditional way of doing a PhD or a doctorate in Germany. So this individual PhD basically uh, is based on an individual agreement between yourself and the supervisor. And it requires that you are able and willing to work, to work and do your research pretty independently. So nobody will stand next to you every day and tells you what to do. You have to be able to think independently and work independently. Of course, always under the supervision of your supervisor. And if she or he is not constantly around, there will be a research team or the department uh, on which you are um, uh, which you are affiliated with, and those colleagues will also be able to help you. So these are the two differences in doing a PhD in Germany. And the DED scholarships are open to both ways. So it is up to you which you prefer and maybe also which is available to you. So financing your PhD, a very important message, which I cannot stress enough, is that there are no tuition fees to pay for PhD studies in Germany at public universities. The difference, for example, between Germany and the US is, um, if I'm not wrong, that the majority of the vast majority, more than 90% of universities in Germany are public universities. And I believe some of the private universities which offer PhD studies, um, they, are also, they also have waivers for tuition fees. So usually when you think about doing your PhD, there are three aspects you're thinking of. Your upkeep, the tuition fees, and the money for research. So in Germany, you don't have to think about tuition fees. The money for research, um, the institute or the university that you are joining, your host institution is going to take care of the costs that are involved with your research. So the only aspect you are left with is how do I live while doing my PhD? And this is exactly where a DED scholarship can come in. Um, however, apart from the DED scholarship, you can also, of course, um, self finance yourself or your parents or family. Um, there is also an individual funding possible through a research associate contract. So that is uh, no very common in the US where you work and do your PhD at the same time. The living cost in Germany, of course, always depending on your lifestyle and also the place where you would be. Is it a huge city? like Munich, which is very expensive, or is it a middle-sized university uh, town? But this approximate uh, of 918 euros is uh, a safe bet, I would say. Yeah. So um, the DED scholarship for PhD is higher than that, but I will be going to that. So applying for a scholarship, let's say that is an option. So I'm going to present to you the scholarship programs that DED offers that help you gain your degree from Germany. So the first one is uh, called Research Grants, Doctoral Programs in Germany. And um, these grants are open to all fields and topics. So the DED does not um, prioritize or focus on specific fields, STEM, for example, um, since finding uh, research groups or supervisors in this field is usually easier than, for example, in social sciences or humanities, um, the majority of our scholarship holders are from the STEM field. But that might should not lead you to the assumption this is where the focus is. It's simply oftentimes easier to find a supervisor, and this is the consequence out of it. But if you talk to your friends in in anthropology or literature, please tell them DED scholarships are also available to them. So the research grants uh, and the doctorate programs in Germany means um, you can uh, have a scholarship that lasts for 36 months or for three years. Um, you'll be in Germany, um, do your PhD, and at the end of it, you get your degree. So these three years does not mean that you have to stay in Germany. 
because in case your research involves fieldwork in your home country, it is possible that you can travel to your home country to collect data or carry out field experiments, whatever your research entails, for up to 12 months within this three-year time frame. So this is possible. Yeah. So the um, monthly stipend uh, will be 1,200 euros and additional allowances. So the, these additional allowances correspond very much to those that you will get uh, if you have a master's DED scholarship that I had mentioned before, a health insurance cover, uh, a flight to Germany and back. Um, by the way, a lot of um, applicants are also asked about what happens to my family when I'm on a scholarship. Your family can actually, family means spouse and immediate children and only one spouse per scholarship holder. Um, they can join you in Germany for the duration of your studies and then for them the uh, health insurance cover will be extended to the entire family and small allowances will be paid for the spouse and each child. Not as much as 1,200 euros per month but we have quite a number of scholarship holders who are in Germany with their families. So then we have research grants uh, by nationally supervised for binationally supervised doctoral degrees. That means that you are uh, registered as a PhD student in your home country and within your PhD studies in your home country, you want to spend uh, a certain amount of time as a research stay in Germany to carry out research there or to do whatever uh, re, uh, relates to your PhD that is not possible in your home country. So in the binationally supervised doctoral degree, you can spend up to two years in Germany as a research stay. Yeah. So the value is exactly the same, uh, the 1,200 euros and this additional allowance. But after this up to two years, it can be one and a half years, it can be nine months, depending on what it is that you need to do in Germany, you have to return to your home country and complete your degree there. You cannot switch once on the scholarship to finishing your degree in Germany, that is not possible. So then we have research grants, one year or short-term grants. The only difference here to the binationally supervised degree is the length uh, of your stay in Germany. So also here you have to be registered as a PhD student or a postdoc in your home country. You can spend one year, that is seven to 12 months, or shorter, one to six months in Germany, but you have to return to your home country and complete your degree there. So the main application requirements uh, for a PhD scholarship are obviously an, a master's degree, and it would be good if it would be excellent excellent grades. Also here completed less than six years at the time you apply for the scholarship. The core, the most important aspect uh, of your application is your research proposal, obviously because this is what you want the money for. So your research proposal should be convincing, should be relevant and well planned. What does that actually mean? Um, relevant, of course, it shouldn't be um, something that uh, five other researchers have already uh, done, have already answered the research question and you want to do exactly the same. So if you um, so propose such a research, then it also, sh also shows that you haven't done your literature review properly. Um, if this sounds um, common sense to you, um, it isn't. I have, uh, these are basically my experiences with applicants and I feel I just want to share this with you so that you do not make the same mistake. So a thorough, thorough literature review is key because how else will you even identify your research gap that you want to fill with your research? Well-planned means that uh, a part of your um, application documents is also a detailed work plan for the three anticipated years of your research where we want you to show that you have thought your research through that you say, I start from point A, and these are the steps, and this is the duration of the steps, and this is the time of those steps within my three years that I'm going to uh, undertake in order to, after 36 months, going to uh, defend my thesis and graduate and get my degree. 
Yeah, so this is very, very important. Um, second, most important to the quality of your research proposal is that you either, and there we go back to the two ways of doing a PhD, that you either have an admission letter to the structured uh, PhD program offered by a German university or uh, an, a confirmation letter of a German supervisor that she or he is willing to supervise you for the proposed research that both of you have agreed upon. So without these, um, without having fulfilled these requirements, your application will be incomplete and cannot be considered. This is really, really important. And there are actually less than three months to the annual application deadline of 31st of October via the funding-guide.de website. This is at the same time also um, a scholarship funding database, which I would like to show you very briefly and share my screen with you. I hope you are still with me here. So um, the URL is a bit long, but if you uh, key in funding-guide.de, this is exactly where you're going to be uh, taken. Um, let's say you can uh, key in your criteria here on the left side of the screen. Very important is that you put in your country of origin. Yeah. So I was told that a majority of you uh, who have joined us today are from Nigeria. So now we don't want to go to Lagos. Lagos. So Nigeria, and uh, you are all doctoral candidates. So I leave everything blank, but I click here on the defunding programs only. And there we have 14 hits. And you can see the programs here that I had just, just explained to you, the research grants, short-term grants, and so on. And let's just click on the most interesting and probably most important to you, the research grants doctoral programs in Germany. Oops, sorry. So, and here you see a full explanation of what the scholarship and its application entails. So you have an overview, the objective of it, who can apply, application requirements, some of those I had already uh, mentioned to you, the application procedure, what requirements must be met, not yet. So application documents, how they have to be uploaded, the application is online via this portal. And then once you have read through this, you can submit your application or start the application process by clicking on this submitting an application icon, yeah? However, the scholarship uh, application portal only opens four to six weeks before the actual deadline. So from mid-September to end of October, it will be open. However, it never hurts to actually check uh, the requirements way before that. So then how to find the supervisor? The big, big $1 million question. And also here, I want to explain one of the search machines or databases to you that you can use and that I would very much recommend to find research contacts in Germany. So let's assume you want to do your PhD uh, as an individual agreement with your supervisor. So what you are looking for is that one person who has the expertise that you need. So we can filter by subject group. So I also know many of you are from engineering. So let's uh, select that, click on search. It's a search machine. It's, it's, no, it's not rocket science, but however, I just want to give you an idea how that works. So according to the subject areas uh, that we have here, engineering uh, has 6,290 hits. All in all, this search machine contains of about 29,000 uh, departments non, uh, at universities and non-university research institutions with already broken down to uh, research groups. So if you click on the plus, we can uh, now select what we want, engineering general, mining, metallurgy, um, civil engineering, computer science, and so on. 
we click on the plus until there is no plus anymore. And then uh, let's see bioinformatics. And then on the right side of it, we have the universities, for example, University of Göttingen or Bielefeld University or whatever, University of Freiburg. And at this university, the respective um, departments that match our search criteria. And then down here on more, you just find even more. So let's go to uh, genetics and experimental bioinformatics group. So here you have um, the physical address, which you do not really need at the moment, but you can have here the contact doctoral programs, institutions, or you can go straight to the website of that particular university department. There we go. Yeah. And from here, you just read what the uh, department is all about, what they can offer in terms of research opportunities, teaching, publications, and so on. Yeah. So I think this is pretty straightforward and pretty uh, easy to do. So this is uh, uh, gerrit.org. Um, this is a database um, established by the German Research Foundation, which is the largest organization in Germany to distribute research money to German institutions. So just um, a summary of the websites and databases that are crucial and can help you a lot in um, familiarizing yourself with research in Germany. So the first one, research in Germany, is really general info of, about uh, research facilities, research funding, um, how to prepare, um, what, what research is done where. So this is uh, a good um, website to start with. Then you have phdgermany.te. This is a search machine for doctoral positions. That means um, German university departments and non-university research institutes, working groups, already existing research teams, post open positions there in their respective fields. So they say we need so and so many um, PhD students, so and so many postdocs and so on. That is also good, um, easier to find than just looking for a supervisor. Funding guide, I have already explained to you, Garrett.org, we just had, and the higher education compass.te is um, the search uh, tool if you look for a structured PhD program. I know that this is this presentation is being recorded, and so that means you can get, if you uh, don't do this now, you can get those uh, links later on as well. So the supervisor, the elusive individual. So as I mentioned earlier, and as Alex introduced me, I'm the program officer who have, has helped and spoken to quite a number of um, uh, potential applicants who are uh, facing this problem. I have sent emails and nobody has ever responded. So I have um, collected a number of do's and don'ts that hopefully can help you uh, avoiding some of the issues. So let's say you have used all these tools that I have explained to you and now you have the contact of a professor and you write the first email to introduce yourself. Again, this is maybe common sense to you, but these uh, mistakes are made, so please bear with me. So whatever email you write, please only address it to one person. So don't write five different uh, email addresses of different researchers all in the same address line. It's, it makes a bad impression and you will not get an answer. I wouldn't answer. If I would get the impression, I'm just one of many. So spell the name correctly. It's a sign of respect and a sign of you have done your work and you, are, you have the eye for detail enough um, which already qualifies you or shows you as a qualified researcher because research is uh, all about the details. So find out also if um, the person you address is a lady or a gentleman and use his or her title. In the subject line, uh, be specific what you want. What you want is research cooperation in and then you give your specific um, not field, don't make it too vague, but as specific as possible without 
uh, explaining your whole research in the subject line. And then keep in mind, and this I cannot stress enough, keep in mind you are looking to convince a fellow researcher of your value and your potential impact for him or her. So show what you have to offer. So yes, you are a student and yes, you are talking to someone in a higher position with much more research experience and with an expertise that you are seeking to benefit from. However, you are uh, someone who has a master's degree, who has done research and without maybe you knowing it, who has something to offer what the particular researcher is just looking for. Yeah. So do not put your light, uh, don't make your light too small. Yeah. So that means you introduce yourself briefly. You give your academic background uh, in case you are working currently. Mention that if uh, you have a certain research interest or work at a research institution. Mention that. Also your research experience. If it is relevant, mention what research you have done for your master's. If this research is also relevant to what you want to do for your PhD, just for the person receiving this email to get an idea who you are very, very briefly. Then mention how you became aware of this research address. Ideally, you could say, these are just suggestions, but you could say, I read your recent publication on ABC in journal XYZ with great interest, as I am currently also working on that what you're working on for your PhD. Of course, you should have read this publication. Don't just, um, make something up or don't uh, mention something that you're not familiar with because this is an introductory email and you might just get a response an hour later and there might be question, questions in that response that are um, specific to what you said in the email and you need to have an answer yeah so do not lie but read widely and have a reason, have to, an answer to give why you are addressing this particular researcher and why you want to work with her or for him. And then you can draw the logical conclusion. Therefore, I wanted to inquire whether you would be interested and available to act as my supervisor for my PhD project title, so and so. Yeah, so then you have uh, made the logical argument why you are addressing this person. If you do not get a response, that does not necessarily mean he or she is not interested. It might also mean um, they are just overwhelmed or they um, don't have a position at the moment and are too busy to tell you that. So that's why uh, do not give up if you do not get a response. You can, after let's say 10 days, write a polite reminder. But to the first email, do not attach your whole uh, proposal that you by then might already have of 10 or 15 pages, pages or so. The first email is uh, there to attract interest, to generate interest. So attach, I suggest an abstract or a concept note of maybe not more than two pages. But if you have it ready, offer to send the full proposal if he or she is interested after your introductory email. So again, uh, send a polite reminder, uh, acknowledge that the person receiving your email is busy with uh, research or whatever else, uh, but uh, it is not impolite to send a reminder because it uh, shows the, uh, um, the professor you're really serious about what you're proposing. Yeah? If you have, if you have the chance, use your networks. Use your lecturers, um, your master thesis supervisor. Maybe you know any DED alumni in your environment at your university to help you establish contacts. Because it is always the easiest uh, for someone to accept a PhD student if this student was recommended to her or him by someone they know professionally or they have worked with before. Yeah. So um, if you have these people in your field, uh, in your um, in your environment, please ask them and use them. So, um, uh, now I am only left with um, giving you uh, again our contacts, as uh, Alex said. 
I am working at the DED Regional Office for Africa in Nairobi. This is our website. Um, you can find whatever I have told you today also there. We have a Facebook uh, account. Uh, we have also virtual visiting hours uh, during these Corona times on Thursdays from 10 to 11. Thursdays uh, 10 to 11 East African time. Uh, you can register uh, in this link. But you can, of course, also email me. You have my email address here. Um, my name is Anja Bengelsdorf. And I thank you very much for attending and see you maybe virtually next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anja. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, I want to introduce Jackson. Jackson is um, the regional representative for Euraxis North America. And um, Jackson is responsible for promoting Europe as a research destination for um, two researchers in Canada and the US. He will talk about using Euraxis as a, as a tool for finding research and funding opportunities in Europe. Um, so Jackson. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, wow, Anya, that presentation was very in-depth. Uh, you set the bar high, so it's difficult to follow that act. Uh, yeah, I'll just give a brief sort of preface or reminder to the audience that my presentation uh, about Euraxis, which you hear a lot about in the next half hour or so, uh, is about Germ excuse me, Europe in general. Uh, so I won't have a lot of country-specific information. A lot of the times when someone asks, uh, is there a minimum age requirement or maximum age requirement or a question like that, that really will uh, differ on a country by country basis. And then even then, sometimes at a university to university or department with to department basis. Uh, so in a lot of the questions that we'll be asking or, and answering in the Q&A session, uh, I can really give a general overview. I would say now that Anya's finished her presentation, uh, if you have any questions for her, please feel free to, to add them to the questions box our questions field while I'm giving my presentation. Uh, hopefully, if, if you are able to do that now, she'll have a few minutes to review those while I'm presenting, uh, and we'll jump right into the Q&A afterwards. So on my side, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And I hope we can provide you some useful information uh, beyond Germany's borders if, about Europe as a whole. Uh, so I'm here with Euraxis, uh, my colleague who you saw earlier when we all had our webcams on, uh, Dr. Daria Vujtinirka, John and I represent Euraxis North America. So there's eight hubs for the Euraxis project uh, outside of Europe, across the world. Uh, so she and I are responsible for the US and Canada. Uh, so as I begin, I'd like to, to ask you to keep in mind that I'll hopefully answer a lot of the questions that naturally might be occurring to you uh, while I present. So you can save the questions for me until towards the end. Uh, and then for Anya, again, like I said, you can just drop those in right now. Um, if you have a question addressed to a specific speaker, Please just mention this is for Jackson, this is for Anya, or you can just say this is about Europe in general, or this is about Germany specifically. And that way that'll help Alex when he's moderating the Q&A session uh, to know who to ask right away. Um, and if it's something relevant for both of us, you can mention that, we'll both try to chime in. Uh, and I just apologize in advance, if we don't have time to get to every question, there's not necessarily a fixed end time to today's uh, presentation. We have more or less budgeted just under an hour and a half of time. Uh, so we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. We also want to spend a little bit of time addressing the questions that uh, you had the opportunity to share during registration. So before today's session started, uh, when you signed up for the GoToWebinar uh, session, uh, there was that optional field for speaker questions. So we've, we've compiled those, and uh, I hope we have a chance to address a number of those in addition to your live questions today. So uh, I'm with Euraxis Researchers in Motion. That's the overarching project name uh, that all of the hubs and all of the Euraxis teams within Europe and outside of Europe, uh, we're, we're all part of this, this wider project. It's a unique pan-European initiative of the European Research Area, or ERA. ERA enables the free circulation of researchers, scientific knowledge, and technology. It's backed by the European Union and its member states, as well as associated countries. Uh, so when I say European Union, uh, it's a European Union project, it's not limited to the 27 EU member states. It's also what are called Horizon 2020 associated countries. I'll go into that in a tiny bit more detail. Uh, but basically, we're talking about Europe as a whole. So when I say ERA or the European Research Area, it really does refer to the continent. And the overall aim is to support researcher mobility and career development while enhancing scientific collaboration between Europe and the world. Uh, and this is, again, benefiting researcher mobility and researcher circulation to help the knowledge uh, circulate in both directions. 
Uh, and then a brief reminder, all services of your access are free. So when you're contacting uh, any of my your access colleagues inside of Europe or outside of Europe, uh, any services we offer are free. When I say, please register and make a profile on the website, none of this at any point is going to involve any sort of payment uh, or, or anything like that. So here's a very brief visual overview. Most of my presentation will be, I'll, I'll sort of give a live guide of the Euraxis website. Uh, the, the slide here, the slides here that I'm showing are really gonna be brief. I'll just spend a couple more minutes here. Uh, this is a visual overview of what the website's layout looks like. So there's a jobs and funding search tool, uh, not unlike what Anya presented for German opportunities. And these will be looking at opportunities throughout Europe. Uh, again, some specifically for research and job opportunities, others for funding for your own pre-existing projects or your own bottom-up project that you would like to propose and get funding for. Uh, another is a partnering, partnering tool and hosting search. So if you're looking for a host institution, a university or research institute, because you already have your research idea in mind, uh, but you need a European university to, to tie that research to, uh, you can find a hosting tool. Through the hosting tool, you can find these universities. Oftentimes they want you to, to research with them. They have labs, they have offices, they have departments, uh, and you'll be bringing in uh, overarching era funding from the European research area. So they're very happy to have you there. Uh, and then for a partnering tool, you can find other colleagues uh, in your field uh, to, to jo join an existing lab or office uh, or find a partner for a project and develop that together. In terms of career development, I'll be speaking to that briefly. Uh, there are a lot of interactive areas in the website that will help you get an idea for what your next steps might be if you don't already know or if you do plan that out further. Information and assistance. Uh, this tab is very vaguely worded, but you'll actually find a lot of information in that category. So I'll save that all for the website. And then finally, a small word on the branding, uh, Euraxis Worldwide, that is the name for the Euraxis presence of this project outside of Europe. So within Europe, there are several uh, support centers, there's national portals in every European country. Uh, they all have a very strong country specific presence. In this case, there's eight hubs outside of Europe. Uh, my colleague and I represent the US and Canada here in North America. Uh, but given the global nature of webinars and the fact that Europe is open to all uh, and is trying to attract researchers of all nationalities in all research fields at any stage in their research career, uh, we were really happy to work with Afrosnet, which is an American nonprofit, uh, and, and open this uh, webinar to everyone. Like I said, all of our services are free. Uh, and in a very general sense, all of our opportunities are open, our talks are open. Uh, so we're really happy to have you here in the audience today. In terms of what we do, you'll see that uh, throughout the rest of my presentation. I'll just give a brief word as to how. So in terms of linking researchers to Europe, when I say this, I mean European researchers and I mean non-European researchers. So we do this through events. Now with the current pandemic, obviously this is all virtual. I think it's presented a lot of opportunities for us and forced us uh, to think on our feet, think quickly and adapt. So with these webinars, we're reaching uh, larger audiences than we, we have in the past with traditional approaches to giving talks at universities where we can only really accommodate and uh, reach out to the people that, that walk in the, the presentation room. So this is a really exciting way to reach new people, answer questions to people beyond the immediate cities we're visiting. Uh, for example, we have flagship events and uh, certain categories that we really try to focus on. So European scientific diasporas in our North America hub in particular, uh, we have a lot of European researchers who have either been in the US and Canada for a short period of time uh, or have sort of made their life here and plan on staying here in the long term, but still retain strong ties to their, their previous universities in Europe or their previous communities, their home country, so to say, um, while they've adopted a second country here. And in that sense, we help the, that researcher diaspora group uh, connect further both in North America and in Europe. Uh, so in that sense, you can see the hub services is a way to connect you to, to other researchers. Uh, is, it, is other brief examples, we have quarterly newsletters where we do deep dives into a country's research profile. Uh, so just like you learned a lot about Germany today, you might find interviews and, and written information in quarterly newsletters, uh, very similar to what, to what Anya presented. And we partner with experts like her in order to, to share a certain country's uh, research uh, environment. How do we do that uh, in terms, how do we share information on European funding opportunities? Uh, we send two emails monthly. If you answered yes to subscribing to our email newsletter when you signed up uh, this weekend, you should get your first bi-monthly flash note from us. Uh, these will have news on European funding and the European Commission and European Union in general. Uh, these will have funding opportunities and events. And in particular, now these events are virtual. So regardless of where you're living or working, you'll be able to attend most of these just by hopping on a webinar. Uh, and then on our website and social media, we promote a lot of these. Uh, I'll briefly mention now, and I'll expand on this a little bit later, uh, in addition to just promoting job opportunities and how, helping people search our job portal, uh, there are funding opportunities that we do not run through your access, 
but we try to be sort of the, the middleman that help you find these opportunities. These are European Commission funded uh, grants and fellowships. And sometimes the European countries themselves offer national funding that we'll highlight. So to briefly just mention the name now so that you can be listening for it during the presentation and our follow-up material that we'll send out tomorrow, uh, Maurice Klodowska Curry Actions, uh, European Research Council grants, and then again, the national funding from different countries. Um, and you've learned a lot about Germany today. So there's a lot of German opportunities there as well. Uh, you can sign up for our bi-monthly flash notes, which include our quarterly newsletters and other information, uh, just by sending us an email, northamerica at youraxis.net. That'll be on the next slide. And again, that'll be in the follow-up email we send you tomorrow. Or you can register on the portal, and I'll be sharing that with you a little later. That's basically what the rest of this presentation will be. Uh, and then for research career development, just some really brief examples. We will have other webinars uh, in the long term this year, next year, um, on how to get published, grant, grant writing, fellowship writing, uh, mentoring. Anya gave a great German specific example about um, trying to, to find that elusive PhD supervisor. Uh, we'll also give similar types of advice. So I think you can cast your net wide and through your access and through other uh, partners like the AAD, uh, find ways to, to sharpen your stick and really advance and take that next step in your research career. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up the presentation portion of the slide here, uh, of the slideshow, just with my contact information. Again, my colleague, uh, Dr. Bukhanir Karajan and I are really happy to be in touch. This email address, northamericaurexis.net, is uh, general to the hub. So she and I will both see those and we'll answer uh, usually within a few business days to try to help you get the information you're looking for. So with that, I'm going to jump in and I'm minimizing this window slightly. Uh, so that those on mobile will have a decent time reading the text. So bear with me just while I adjust this. I'm also going to uh, take myself off video so that you're not. I'm not competing for real estate while you look at the website. Uh, just give me one second. Okay, so that should be a little bit bigger now while you're looking at the portal. I'll take myself off the webcam. Let me make sure this works. Okay, great. So I'll send the link after uh, this portion where I go over everything. I really don't necessarily want you to be jumping into the website itself because I'm gonna sort of be in the driver's seat explaining every section. Uh, so as you're looking here, uh, let me start with a sort of quick philosophical introduction. The website itself is one of the most important components of your access services. Uh, your access is useful if you wanna do short-term or long-term research in Europe. So this is very complementary to the Germany specific presentation Anya gave. Uh, the main purpose of Euraxis and the website is to help researchers and their family with practical information uh, when they're relocating from one country to another. And I mean this in both senses of the word. Uh, if you are from outside of Europe moving to Europe, or if you're in one European country moving to another. I'm not talking uh, the wider European border specifically, uh, just any European country, regardless of where you're coming from. The idea is that this is an overarching tool to give you the information you need. Um, the history of this is that in the early 2000s, so just under two decades ago, researchers, the European Commission realized that researchers were requesting more practical information and tailor-made assistance for them when they were moving to that new country, uh, given that there's a, a large administrative burden when you're moving countries and it's difficult locating information on moving to, to a brand new country, in particular when you already have a research career you're expected to jump right into. Uh, and as any region of the world, Europe has many languages, different cultures, uh, legal systems change on a country by country basis, et cetera. So it was, again, very burdensome, burdensome to figure all of this out uh, while you were starting that new research career or your studies. Uh, the website was revamped in 2017 and last year in 2019 had, had an overhaul as well and new features were added. So if you're looking if you're for any reason coming across guides that are more than three years old on how to use your access services or how to how to guide yourself on the website i would say really limit yourself to a documentation that was published in 2017 uh, and beyond more recently in these last three years just because uh, you may find some terminology has changed the layout has changed and the services offers have expanded um, so as i'm here on the website which i'll share the direct link with you afterwards the, there's information on the main homepage, which is an official website of the European Union, as you can see in this top left here in small text, uh, just in case you ever come across uh, websites and you're not sure if they're offic officially associated uh, with the European Union. Uh, there is a lot of timely information on the European Commission's response and the, the pan-European response to the coronavirus pandemic. So you will see here, uh, if you click some of these different buttons, 
information on open calls right now for research, particularly in STEM fields, uh, to combat coronavirus. So regardless of a lot of traditional deadlines having been passed for certain calls, there's been additional emergency funding assigned. So I would suggest if these are your fields of interest, and I know many of you responded that uh, you are potentially looking to move immediately if, if everything falls into place and works uh, as you wish, this may be an option for you. Uh, so I'd encourage you to look at all of that. Um, yeah, just briefly summarizing that, there's a small number of open calls for coronavirus research. The, the earliest deadline that's still open is late September, uh, and the latest one that's still open is mid-February. Obviously, in the these last several months, there have been some calls that have opened and closed uh, for emergency funding. But if you're looking for immediately relevant opportunities, you can find those there. So I'm going to scroll down again on the main your access web page, not in any sub page here. Uh, if I go all the way here, you can find these four tabs into who that basically describe who our target audience is. And I'll just read it out briefly. Researchers, entrepreneurs, research organizations and universities, and then finally business. Um, entrepreneurs and business are new in this this revamped update that we've added in the last year um, so by default the research tab is clicked i'm just going to make sure we're here um, this is a live updated number of the current research positions available uh based jobs available um, if i refresh this half an hour from now or one hour from now you'll find this number goes up or down slightly uh this is not a pre-programmed number that just looks nice. I mean, this is really plugging in live from the database. Um, so I'll address this a little further in a moment. If I go to entrepreneurs, these funding opportunities are rel relatively new to the service. I would encourage you just to click the funding button here uh, and see from the entrepreneurial startup aspect of this, what's available. Uh, research organizations and universities. Again, this number is also live updating, just over 100,000. Uh, number of registered members, these are registered members within these organizations and people looking for organizations. It's sort of a matchmaking tool, you could call it. Uh, if you register yourself, you can mark yourself as, as you know, you, you wanna be uh, sought after and looked for and searched for. And then these universities and uh, research organizations will feel free to contact you if so. I just wanna emphasize that they don't contact you through us. Our website is sort of the database where this information is hosted. Uh, but it's not like a lot of networking platforms where we host the messaging platform. Really, we host the contact information and then you take direct contact. And I say this uh, just to sort of let you know that in this case, you would be following Anya's advice example for her presentation, where you're taking direct contact and reaching out as you best see fit. Um, and most likely this would be email or phone call. And we're not somehow monitoring this. We don't have information or statistics we can track, you know, how many members contact universities, how many research organizations have contacted uh, your access members, because that that's all done outside of our portal and outside of our scope. Um, there's a lot of advantages to that as well, just because you don't have to deal with another layer between you and the person you want to communicate with. Uh, and then finally, business. These are academic and non-academic research institutions uh, that are posting vacancies on, their, on our website for free, partnering options and hosting offers. And if you're with an organization, you also can register on behalf of that organization to post opportunities. Uh, I'm gonna scroll up to the main section of the website now that that quick overview is done. Uh, and there's an how can we help you section. Uh, given the responses to the pre-registration questions and those live polls at the very beginning of the webinar today, I'm just going to put what I think applies to a majority of folks in attendance today. And that is a researcher searching for job and study offers. So if I click search, that will jump you, just given the nature of those two answers, to what is the next tab if you would click this, jobs and funding. This is the search. I will be here for a few minutes going in detail what the different uh, toggles are that you can, sort of the filters that you can turn on and off. Um, so the number of available jobs is quite high. I just want to quickly go over. It seems like there's a discrepancy in number. It says there's, I'm just going to round up for simplicity's sake, about 8,000 available offers uh, when it comes to, to jobs here. But if I go back, I was telling you before that there's over 13,000 research positions available. Uh, that is just a small difference in the terminology. So job positions is unique positions for individuals. If I go forward again to where I was, these offers can have multiple positions within them. Uh, so for example, this might be one offer that is hiring five researchers. Uh, there's five positions uh, within a single office, for example. So if you basically do the math, 
I think it was just under double, just under double. So for example, many of these offers are for one position. Some of these will be for two, three, for researchers um, within the same office or same department. So there's no sort of mathematical error there. That's just a difference in terminology uh, and a difference in how they're displayed. So if I start at the top here and I go to research field, uh, I know a lot of people in the audience, uh, a large majority of you are in STEM. I just wanna briefly mention as, as you highlight this to perhaps colleagues and friends of yours that the opportunities here are not limited to STEM. This includes the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, so you will find several opportunities here. Uh, I actually haven't practiced like specifically what filters I'll put on in advance. I'm just going to try to pick a few sciences here uh, and see, pick a few random STEM fields and uh, just see what sort of matches we get. So that looks like a good number. Okay. So I've put on five. Obviously, you can do multiple. You don't need to whittle down only one. Uh, so that's research field. If I go to researcher profile, uh, you have R1 through R4. Just to quickly go over this, uh, the European Commission has identified four tiers or levels of researcher profiles. Uh, R1 is undergraduates looking for a PhD position or doctoral training. And in Europe, that would normally be about three or four years. I know this is different on uh, different countries or different continents sort of have different traditions in terms of the length of time. Generally, I would say uh, it's three to four years, although that's not a one size fits all response. Uh, R2 is for those who have already completed a PhD and want to look for a postdoc position. And if you're not familiar with these, there's a handy need help button that will just pop up a brief uh, definition of all of these so you can make sure that you're, you're searching the criteria that are most relevant to you. Uh, so given our poll responses, I'm going to put uh, the first half of responses there. And it's, re it's remembering the responses from the other fields. If I go to sector, most of these positions will be within academia. Um, you can see the numbers here, for example, Higher Education Institute has a majority, 703 of the remaining filters, uh, of, of the total 8,000 offers. Uh, a lot of these other ones, I think these, these numbers respond to the filters we've put in already. Uh, a lot of these are not necessarily private sector, although that, that's constantly growing. So I'm gonna click Higher Education Institute, and I'm also gonna do SME and Startup for Small Businesses. Um, we encourage private sector and SMEs and startups to post their job to the job board. Like I said before, uh, organizations can register profiles and post offers. So you will find uh, other options beyond purely academic positions. Finally, country, uh, I'm going to do a search in Germany, just given the nature of Anya's presentation to see what we find here. I'm sure there's going to be many overlapping opportunities. Um, you will see here many countries, and let me briefly digest this, you will see the 27 EU member states, uh, the countries that actually make up the European Union, and then you'll see what are Horizon 2020 associated countries, so countries that are not full EU member states, but they pay into the budget of Horizon 2020, which is a seven-year framework program for research and innovation of the European Commission. 2020 is the last year of the Horizon 2020 project. The name sort of implies that it was looking from 2014 all the way to the, the end of the horizon of that seven years, 2020, beginning January 1st of next year, uh, it will be Horizon Europe. And while Horizon 2020 has approximately 80 billion euro in funding in research and innovation, uh, Horizon Europe, the, there's currently budget negotiations underway, but the commission has proposed uh, 100 billion. So there's a lot of hope and expectation that that number will actually be higher. And the previous amount of 80 billion euro uh, was record setting in and of itself. So you'll notice that a lot of countries say, hey, we're not, a lot of European countries say, we're not EU member states, but we see a lot of value in becoming part of this community so that we can have researcher circulation uh, and bring a lot of good researchers to our borders and have a lot of our good researchers uh, continue their careers in other countries. So don't think as you're looking through this list that something's funny uh, or something's off if you see a non-European uh, Union country or even a non Horizon 2020 associated country. Uh, and when you look at a list of these countries, they sort of stick in your head and it's easier to remember them. Uh, you'll also find positions that are funded in other countries. So this, remember, this is a job board. You're searching for, for research and job opportunities. So there may be, uh, Anya was giving an example of you can do research, field search, uh, field research in your home country, uh, as long as you're spending a certain amount of time in Germany based on that German funding. Uh, so for example, if in, in a similar vein, if there's opportunities, uh, you'll find here, there's one opportunity in China, three in Brazil, I'll, I'll leave Brazil checked alongside Germany, just to see, you'll find that there's European funding uh, in a small number of Brazilian, 
Canadian, Chinese, for example, uh, institutes and universities. Uh, so it's not European countries only, although they are the large majority. And then finally, the European research program. So I mentioned before um, national level funding. So uh, for example, France or Germany giving funding uh, for the, from their national governments, that would not be an overarching European Union program. So when you see these 34 opportunities that are not funded there, that could include national funding. Um, I mentioned Horizon 2020. I guess these three are overarching that don't have a subcategory. Uh, so I'll, I'll check that on. And then I mentioned much earlier during the PowerPoint presentation about Maurice Klodowska Curie Actions. Um, those are fellowships that you sort of design at the PhD level and beyond. I'll check those on. The funding's great because you, at that point, you, you propose what you want to research. Uh, you find a host institution, and then the university is very happy to have you because you're actually being funded by this funding scheme itself. Um, and let's see. And then there's there's several different types of Maurice Klodowska Curie actions. So there's individual fellowships, there's co-funding. Uh, I'm actually just going to click search for everything here. Uh, so I'm going to take these approximately 8,000 available offers, narrow it down with all of those searches. Um, let me see. And we'll see what, what comes up. Uh, before I scroll down, I want to briefly summarize the Maurice Clodowski Curie Actions and the European Research Council grants. Those were, you saw the acronyms MSCA and ERC earlier uh, over here. ER, nothing is matching for ERC, but then again, I put a lot of filters on. Um, MSCA is for those looking for a full-time PhD position in Europe. Like I said, there's different levels of these and I'll be happy to share follow-up information. Um, the individual fellowship date closes on September 9th. So it, it, you do have time to get an application together just under a month. I would say uh, in addition to considering hurrying for that, you can also look towards next year and start preparing longer term if you're interested in that, fellow, that individual fellowship uh, funding. Uh, for ERC, that's the European Research Council. These grants are for any field of research and it's bottom up. It's a bottom up basis with no predetermined priorities. Um, just keep in mind that for the ERC grants, researchers of any nationality is open to, to people from any country, uh, but you must have two to, seven, two to seven years of experience since the completion of their PhD. Uh, at a minute. So two years at a minimum since you finish your PhD. So I know that won't be relevant for everyone in the audience, uh, but as you continue to look beyond uh, the next step, that's an option. And if you do have your PhD, I think it was about 9% of people in our live poll that responded, they have the PhD. Um, th this could be something you begin looking at. Um, just keep in mind, if you do see an ERC filter here, that's not for the grants offered by the ERC uh, program itself, but for positions within those teams. So you'd be looking for teams that need additional researchers to join. Um, so as I do that search, you see we, we whittled down with all these really specific uh, tags from just about 8,000 to 44 highly relevant specific results to you if you match this sort of profile that I was filling in. Um, so I'll randomly I'll scroll here. Sometimes you'll see the logo of, of the institution associated there. Uh, because we encourage these universities and research organizations to register, uh, they'll have the sort of, they might have a description that's a bit longer and more in depth. Any, any position that has some sort of European Commission funding um, sort of by, by the rules, they must show up on the your access job portal. So I don't want you to think that this job portal is sort of a simple attempt to collect a couple opportunities. You will find all the relevant opportunities here um, if it involves European Commission funding. So not necessarily every single uh, member state national level funding. However, there's a lot of uh, incentive for the countries themselves to put all their offers here because they know a lot of people are using this, this tool uh, the job board as a one-stop shop uh, because it's just, it can be cumbersome to be on you know 20 different websites doing the search. So you will find a lot of a lot of success just looking on here. I would encourage anyone to to do their search, supplementing it with several different websites. Um, but you will find a lot of opportunities here. So I'm just going to click any one of these that has a logo. So this is in Germany in the biochemistry field. The deadline is at the end of August. Microverse PhD position. Okay. So as I click the opportunity. You'll find a little bit more information. I mentioned the R1 researcher stage, how many hours per week is it? Um, you'll find a somewhat in-depth description, information about applying on the website and the office deadline itself, the office, well, you see the deadline here, the office information itself. And then at the very top, you'll find any position here 
is going to have these four buttons. Sometimes there's no map if they didn't put an address in a certain format. But at a bare minimum, you'll find these first three buttons, where to apply, contact, and save to favorites. If you create a profile, you can save it to your favorites. Uh, again, like I said, all of our services are free, so I highly recommend just making a profile and filling in your information. Um, from this point forward, like I was saying earlier, you're not going to be in touch with the your access representative. When you make contact, you're going to be contacting the institute, the individual. Sometimes it's a person that's a point of contact. Sometimes it's, it's a, just a general department. You'll be taking direct contact with them, which is why when you email this address, we don't necessarily know you did that. Um, so we don't have hard statistics or numbers on you know the number of matches that come from this. Uh, but the idea is we don't want to add an extra layer of burden to you. You can take direct contact uh, and hopefully it was useful that you had you found it through this search. Um, let's see here. I'm going to quickly show you the find hosting section. So in this first jobs and funding tab, you saw we we were just looking for jobs. If I click find hosting, this is where you can turn on the funding programs. I mentioned the Marie's Quotas of Curry Actions Individual Fellowships. If I search here, you'll see 120 results uh, that are still open. They have they have different hosting deadlines because in this case, universities and research institutions, they will essentially communicate with you, have a, a discussion. And if they see that you can't apply until you have a letter from them saying that they would host you if you get an offer. So when you come back to them saying, hey, I got Marie's Kodoska Curry Actions Individual an individual fellowship and I have funding, now I'm ready to move forward with you. In this case, they're saying, these are some of the specific projects uh, we'd like you to, to join us with. So if you know specifically what your field is, what you're looking for, this is a great way to, you can, it's a sort of a three, it's a triangle of, of research. There's you in one corner, there's Marie Sklodowska Curry Actions and other fellowships in another, and then finally the Institute that says, we're really happy you're bringing in outside funding. Uh, so again, the MSCA, individual fellowship call is open until September 9th. Normally, I would encourage people to take several months to prepare. Uh, you can definitely take a look at that information in the meantime. Uh, and then again, just keep in mind that this will reopen next year as well. Uh, PhDs can apply for individual fellowships in the MSCA program. Uh, if you don't know where you want to do your fellowship, this hosting search is going to be really useful because they're specifically looking for people uh, that are MSCA fellows uh, and they want them to join their labs or offices or premises. The next tab here, which I won't spend too much time on is career development. This is more specific to you because you're answering questions, you're going through uh, sort of modules and trainings. So you can do that on your own. But basically, this is divided between researchers, and there's a researchers page here, and organizations, if you want to, as it says here, uh, enhance or supplement the support you provide your own researchers. Uh, so I'd say make a profile and go through these options just to give you a quick overview. There's a lot of tools and text written there. Next up is the partnering tool. This is for registered members who create an account. I've been kind of slowly encouraging you to do that throughout the presentation. Uh, from here, you can search other members and organizations, whether you're looking for a partner in your research or an organization that's looking to hire. Uh, the search is all here. Again, we're sort of hands off. Uh, you, you find the contact information from them directly. So you don't have this bureaucratic layer of us between you and the people you want to contact. So I'd encourage you to register and make yourself searchable as well. So when you make this profile, uh, you can just check a box that says you want to show up in the search results, and then people will contact you. Um, I would also encourage you to, to add your CV. Not everyone necessarily adds their CV or their resume, so it can help you stand out. And obviously, the more detail you have, the more uh, these organizations that are looking to hire or, or interview you uh, know about you. Next up is information and assistance. I said before, this was sort of a generic sounding tab, uh, but it really has a lot of information. This one little piece of, of the overall website is what your access was originally based on and created for. So there's 42 national portals. These are the presence of your access within the European countries. So I mentioned before, uh, my colleague and I are with your access North America. There's eight hubs outside of Europe. Uh, the hubs are basically the your access present, presence outside of Europe. But when you get within Europe, these people will have country specific information. So I said before, after Anya's excellent uh, presentation, you know, I won't be able to answer in that depth questions about, about Germany or other European countries. This is where the EURAXIS officials and representatives uh, at the national portals will be able to give you a lot of good information about what it's like uh, on the ground in that country. Um, these portals are all in English. 
and then sometimes in the local language of that country as well. Uh, but in a general sense, I would say uh, research in, in Europe, if not the world, it, at the higher level tends to be in English. So given that you don't necessarily need to speak the language of the host country uh, in order to advance your career, you can do, uh, with very few exceptions, a PhD in, in any of these countries in English uh, or a postdoc. So these national portals are divided among 18 common issues for researchers moving uh, to another country. And again, this is, you can be in a European country already moving to another European country, or you can be anywhere outside of Europe. Uh, these are 18 sort of common country specific issues. You might have questions about what's the tax system like in Germany? Uh, does Lithuania recognize my diploma in this field? Uh, even if in my country, the degree takes one less year than in Lithuania, for example. Uh, and you'll find expert level information that changes country on a country to country basis here. It's divided into three overarching categories, living in Europe, working in Europe, uh, and leaving Europe. Uh, the idea being that you may be there for a short period of time, or you may be there for a long amount of time. Um, and when you have your specific questions, rather than asking someone that represents uh, your access in one of the hubs outside of Europe, really you would be going to the national portals. Um, so I'll just quickly show here. These will give you an overview of what these topics are that I was mentioning. Uh, you can search for the support centers. So these are the service centers that are just over 600 that are throughout Europe. Uh, sometimes they're universities, sometimes they're research institutions, and they have a special relationship with your access where they act as your access contact point and give you country level expertise. And in particular, they have expert areas in some of those 18 categories, but in general, uh, I'll, I'll move on to the national portals. The national portals will give you these 18 topics divided in these three categories. Um, so instead of living in Europe, working in Europe, leaving Europe, I'm gonna click national portal, portals, show you. So these are the, there should be 42 uh, national portals for the EU member states, the Horizon 2020 associated countries, and then a small number of additional countries. Um, I will briefly mention that Brexit has happened as of the end of January this year. However, because the United Kingdom, like all of the other EU member states and Horizon 2020 countries, fully paid into the budget until at least December 31st of this year, uh, it remains a standard member of Horizon 2020 for funding purposes. Uh, and therefore, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, during negotiations and as things develop further with Horizon Europe, which takes place, like I said, it's a seven year funding program beginning January 1st, 2021. Uh, but now through the end of the year, you, you can treat the United Kingdom as any other country you see here. So just uh, in honor of our earlier presenter, I will go to the Germany example. And you'll see this really has the same uh, layout and format. It's gonna give you information on German specific information on anything related to, to research and innovation. And in different countries, they have different uh, ministries of government that handle different topics. And because this is immigration as well, you'll find foreign office, interior. So resources, they'll get you right there. You don't have the burden of figuring this out on your own. And if I go to information and assistance here in the national portal, you'll see instead of living in Europe, working in Europe and leaving Europe, um, it's all German specific. So if I, let's see, I'm gonna go here and do entry conditions and visa is an example of one of those 18 categories that all the national portals have. And you'll see, for example, really specific information about uh, securing your visa, Every country is different, so I don't have a lot of expertise on this uh, specific to Germany, but for example, in some cases, you have to register uh, with a local office with a, within a certain period of time. Um, if you are from, for example, Switzerland or other countries that aren't part of the EU, uh, but have other agreements with uh, the European Economic Area or European Research Area, uh, certain things may be facilitated. So they'll give you really specific information uh, based on your country. Uh, in some national portals, they'll, for example, ask you what country you're from. Uh, and or they'll have a roadmap, sort of a really interesting infographic that will help you find that information. Uh, all the portals are slightly different, but they cover the same categories. And here you'll see European Union and German laws that really just go in depth explaining based on your specific research, if you're gonna be here between six months and 12 months, uh, what happens with the German logistics regarding your short-term mobility. Uh, so this is really useful if you know where you wanna go. I would say if you have your specific country in mind like Germany or a small number of countries, it may be that you want to be, for example, in a French speaking country and you have quite a few options to go through, you can go through the national portal uh, for those countries. You can look at the Belgian national portal, uh, the French national portal, uh, the Swiss national portal, and from there compare and contrast the logistics that they, that they share with you. Uh, the next section here, I'm gonna close out there. 
is your access worldwide. These are the eight hubs that I mentioned, and you can see a small icon more or less in, in the countries and continents here. Uh, this is the presence of your access outside of Europe. So we're not country level experts like the national portals are or, or the, the, the offices in those countries. Uh, but our, our aim is to reach an audience of researchers, regardless of nationality and research field. So like I said, um, even though my colleague and I cover the US and Canada, we're not only trying to promote these opportunities in Europe to American or Canadian researchers, uh, the nationality does not matter. We simply want uh, people at any stage in their research career to see the European research area as a good destination for their next step uh, in terms of career growth and career development. Uh, so you'll have, we'll have different colleagues that can answer different questions. Um, I would say in general, please feel free to be in touch with us uh, in North America, just because we are really happy to partner with AfterSnet on this webinar and last week's webinar. If you're interested in learning a little bit about France's research destination, uh, in the follow-up email that I sent tomorrow, uh, I'll either include a recording to last week's webinar where we had a great presenter uh, sort of compliment Anya's presentation today talking about France, uh, or I'll, I'll just allow you to email me and I'll send you a link to that one. Uh, but this is a great opportunity to get country specific information and then Europe, uh, information about Europe generally. Uh, so if you click here, for example, your access North America, this would just be the content that my colleague and I cover. We have news, we have virtual events, for example, today's webinar, you can see right here. And this was our description for the webinar we have right now. Um, the main objective of your access worldwide, I'll just leave this map open for a second, is to inform the research community in our host region, in our host region about the different funding opportunities. Um, we collect grants and fellowships that are available from the European Union and the national funding agencies, like I mentioned previously. Uh, we'll send those via those bi-monthly flash note emails twice a month. We post the news and events on our web portal, like I was just showing you. Uh, and then we disseminate information widely on our social media uh, and more. So we share these funding opportunities. We cover interdisciplinary topics. So we'll do webinars and trainings on science communication, uh, transitioning from academia to industry, uh, mentoring, and then other topics of interest. So if you have feedback, we also really appreciate getting emails and understanding what you want so that we can hopefully help tailor future events to you. Um, finally, My Your Access. This is where you can create that custom researcher profile. Uh, you would be registering with your name and email address and some biographical information, enabling your research profile here. And then from there, you can make yourself searchable so that other members and research organizations and universities can search for you. And this is where I would encourage you also um, to upload your CV. Uh, you can also sign up for job vacancy notifications, meaning that instead of doing manually this search every, every day or bookmarking a search, when you're searching for jobs, for example, um, you can basically do that same search, but then ask for the, the system to give you emails. So all the relevant uh, matches will, will hit you on a, a frequent basis. You just check your email, you'll see what's been posted uh, recently. I also wanna briefly mention regarding the jobs and funding search that uh, I think I was saying earlier, any, any uh, opportunity that has European Commission funding is required to be posted on the Your Access portal. So you know you're really getting most of the opportunities out there. Um, but in a similar sense, not every single university, for example, has the manpower or the knowledge uh, about posting to our portal. So we, we have contracts with existing European job boards. I know off the top of my head, there is a Danish job board uh, and a German job board, if I'm not mistaken, among five or six others. So when you're searching for those jobs, rest assured that it's not simply what the Euraxis representatives are aware of. It's also what some private sector uh, job boards have found and then they agree to share that information with us. So you're really casting quite a wide net. Um, let's see here. So I would say it, it's, a great, it's a great way to search quite widely and they also get screened. So if you, for example, were posting an opportunity on behalf of an organization, a job opportunity or a research opportunity, uh, it wouldn't be live on our website within a minute. Uh, it may take a day or two because a representative is filtering that to make sure it's first first of all not a scam uh, that you are really with the people you say you are um, that all the information is there so for example if you don't post contact information or your description is too vague uh, we think it brings the quality of the job search down so everything you see when you're searching for a job anything that matches your filters will be in depth enough that you feel like uh, all the information is presented to you so the quality of anything you find is quite good uh, so like I said I encourage you to, to enable your researcher profile and add your CV. The CV is in what's called the Europass format. So this is another link that if you just Google uh, or search on your favorite search engine, Europass, uh, and I can send a follow-up information if you send me an email, 
uh, basically you can create a free euro pass following their format you type in all the information and it exports to you a document that's in the standardized format that helps uh, people looking to hire or bring in uh, students and researchers, uh, it makes it really easy to compare across different CVs and cover letters. Uh, so I would say just do spend, do budget some time to create your CV in the Europass format. Um, with that, I will stop sharing my screen uh, and I think I'll ask Alex to introduce the next section of our presentation. All right, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jackson. So we will um, give the presenters the chance. There are a couple of, um, a lot of questions that have come in. So we will give the, um, the presenters a chance to actually answer some of these questions as many as we can, time will allow. So um, I wanna go to the questions and then perhaps ask Anya, um, one of the um, first questions that came in, was um, whether there are um, age restrictions of any sort in PhD research, like um, in Germany. Um, um, so um, I don't know if you want to, you want to answer that, Anya. Um, yes, I can do that. Uh, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah, yes. we can. Okay. Um, well, I can tell you for a fact, when it comes to DED scholarships, there are no age limits to applicants as a person, only to applicants' degrees, yeah, as I highlighted in my presentation. So your previous degree should, uh, at the time of the scholarship application, not be older than six years. Um, when it comes to the age limit, um, uh, when you do the research in the institutions or the universities, the universities also don't have age limits for accepting students. Um, I, okay, I don't think there is an age limit as such, as a formal requirement or formal criteria. Um, I can imagine that if someone is a bit um, older and the professor is very young, then there might maybe be a personal hesitation on the side of the professor, but this has nothing to do with Germany. This might just be a personal feeling or personal preference. But uh, in order to make a long story short, no, there are none, I would say, as I'm aware of. Okay. Um, uh, I'll quickly, uh, so, so I can see a couple of questions here. Uh, I'll jump in when I think it's relevant. And then also I appreciate you, Alex, sort of letting me know questions that might be good for me. Um, and when possible, I'll compliment Anya's answers. Um, in a lot of the questions will be specific to different countries and then even change within a university to university context. So many of these questions, my answer will just consistently be, it depends. Um, there's no there's no pan-European uh, age requirement or age restriction. So in, in that case, I don't have much of an answer to provide. Uh, someone is asking a question about um, getting or doing a master's degree. In, in Germany, I'd just like to briefly share a, a more pan-European response. Uh, so one program that I think is a great resource to start, start looking uh, is what's called the Erasmus Mundus Joint Master Degrees. Uh, I, I won't speak at length, but basically it's a program, um, it, it's a joint master degree uh, that is delivered by an international consortium. So it's a great way that if you're not yet at the PhD level, uh, you, you can fulfill that master's. I'm really just going to share a link in this case uh, for follow-up reading, but there there are some resources. In general, at the, from the Euraxis perspective, the large majority of opportunities are PhD level and above. Your nationality does not matter. Your research mat your research field uh, does not matter, and it can be short-term or long-term, uh, but really the, the large bulk tend to be uh, PhD level. So I'm just going to share in the chat right now the Erasmus Mundus joint master degree uh, description where you can read more from the official European Commission website. Uh, and from my side, um, I can point you again to um, a search machine. Um, I can also share that in the questions section. Uh, and that search machine basically allows you to uh, search for any degree course, starting from bachelor's up to even P, uh, postdoc, I think. In any particular field, you can filter according to language of instruction. You can filter according to the location. Uh, the subject area, of course, and um, so this is, and then you can have, uh, you click on any 
uh, course that uh, meets your interest and all the details, all the details. I promise every single detail that you need to know in order to apply or to help you make that decision whether this is the right course for you um, is there so that you can click yourself through. So I'm going to share that also in that section. So I know there is a question about uh, if there are plans for your access to expand its its uh, worldwide presence. So obviously, when I say worldwide, I mean the the eight hubs that I mentioned, and I'm with North America. Uh, I know there's there are constantly discussions about what next steps could look like. I'm not aware of of any internal dialogue, uh, so I, I wouldn't expect anything in the immediate short term. But I will say, just as a matter of um, looking at the past to see if that somehow informs the future. Uh, the Australia and New Zealand hub was was recently launched within the last year, uh, and then the Korea hub, which is the country specific hub, uh, launched within the last few years. So if we just dial back the clock of three or four years, I mean the presence of the hubs was significantly smaller. Uh, so I think the idea is that we want to reach people uh, all across the world, but in the absence of of your access presence in your country or continent or region, uh, please do feel free to reach out to to my colleague and I. Yes, um, thank you, Jackson, for that. So as um, Anya is um, putting the link there, um, there is a question Thank here. You. Yeah, <laughs> there is a question here for um, Anya. Um, the person wants to know um, what DAD um, looks looks for before awarding scholarship. Um, the person is asking because they said they want to apply for um, the DAD scholarship and then. The, um, the DAD partner institution in Ghana, um, um, their discussions, discussions with them show that they don't really have um, an exact criteria. So she wants to know um, what specifics the DAD looks for before awarding any scholarship. Now you picked that one question where I wasn't 100% sure what I can say. <laughs> So I advised um, the lady to, because um, as I said, I'm in the regional office in Nairobi, so we are dealing mainly with uh, the countries in Eastern Africa, but we have an information point, which is a smaller DED office in Accra and another one in uh, Johannesburg, in case someone from that region is listening in. And I advised her to um, uh, get in touch with our office there. But in general, I can say that DED scholarships are awarded based on academic merit. So we do yeah. not um, um, discriminate uh, on terms of gender or, or um, any other criteria. Academic merit is the one and only criteria that we use to award scholarships. Okay. And then this question is from um, this. It's also to you, Anya. <laughs> she yeah. um, the person wants to know that for the structured PhD programs, can a candidate apply for multiple programs to increase their chances of getting the DAD scholarship? Um, I I don't know. Do you have an answer to that question? Yes, yes. I would actually. This is a good question, and I would definitely advise to do that, just for strategic reasons, because um, as I said. The scholarship application deadline, there's only one per year. So if you only apply for admission to one course and you are not taken for whatever reason, then you have to wait a whole year until the next application deadline uh, in order to submit an application with an admission letter. So um, apply for, I wouldn't say as many as you can, but a reasonable number, let's say is two or three. But of course, these should be the courses that you would really want to pursue. Yeah. But I think three, two or three are a good number. Apply for them. If you are taken for all of them, then you are spoiled for choice. And then you can still decide for yourself which one you want to submit uh, for the DAD scholarship. But definitely more than one, if possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, this question is to Jackson. Um, yeah. So this person wants to know that um, just as there are formats for Europass CV and cover letters, are there any specific formats for research proposals for PhD programs in Europe? Um, Great question. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so I'm not aware of any consistent across the board requirement. Uh, the reason that 
that the commission created that Europass format for the CV in the cover letter is specifically for uh, something like the Euraxis portal, where it's one it's one portal, it's one platform, uh, and they know that people with with job offers and research offers are going to be reviewing a lot of information. And if it weren't across this specific this uh, specific format, uh, it would be really hard to compare apples to oranges, so to say, just with how everything's written. But in this case, um, once you're applying for a job that you see on the portal, it's no longer through the portal. It's really direct with that university or organization. So in that case, they will specify, uh, hopefully the large majority of them will specify the format that they want it in um, or, or give you guidelines and how to structure that. So I would say uh, you don't have to worry about a very specific format. Okay. I can only support what Jackson said about the Europass uh, format. We also uh, support or um, encourage people to use it exactly for uh, purposes of compatibility because the Europass format asks for specific information. And when you give this information and somebody else also gives them, then they are more easily comparable. But when it comes to the PhD proposal, the only formal requirement we have that is uh, not more than 15 pages long. But otherwise, we expect that uh, a researcher uh, at that level of uh, intending to do a PhD knows what uh, parts um, make uh, a research proposal. So, yep. I mean, you can even Google that. It's it's really no rocket science to do that. So, yeah. Uh, so I'll jump in. I, yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll quickly say, and then we can jump into to Alex's curated question. Um, I'm also reviewing some of the questions during pre-registration when, when people were submitting their, their registration within the last several days or weeks. Um, someone asks, I, so I, I don't have a specific answer, but I have a, a task for you. I would like to know the top schools that offer a master's of science and PhD programs in chemical engineering uh, with funding. So I don't have a specific answer for, for the asker of this question, but I will say uh, from the Euraxis perspective, um, the best way to move forward with that inquiry and, and get initial an initial step to put your feelers out would be to contact the national portals of your access, which was towards that middle portion of my website uh, demonstration. Uh, because when you say the top schools that offer XYZ programs uh, within your field, they'll be able to give you the lay of the land and explain uh, these information on these are the number of universities by uh, number of researchers or students and it basically help you whittle down your own search further. Uh, but in general, your access representatives that aren't with those national portals or service centers, there's over 600 service centers throughout Europe, uh, wouldn't really be able to answer. And I don't think you would ever get a pan-European response. You would be asking that on a country by country basis. So you could contact uh, someone at your access Germany, or if, if you wanna go to Italy, your access Italy, and just say, this is the field I'm interested in. I wanna be in Southern Italy and not Northern Italy. Uh, can you please just let me know what schools meet these criteria and hopefully within a couple of days their their ability is to sort of filter that information to you uh, and respond with country level knowledge okay. so from the dd perspective i just want to highlight again that dd phd scholarships are open to all fields and studies we do not make any we do not give preferences or uh, give preferences to fields or universities um Personally, I have a bit of an ambivalent relationship with rankings because particularly when it comes to research, what you need is expertise. And, um, or that one, if, if let's say you want to do a pure research PhD, you need that one or two or three, I don't know how many are available, expert in your field who can guide you through it. And at, at that case, it doesn't really matter where this person is based. Of course, if it's a really prominent and um, well-known researcher, he or she will also be at a very uh, distinguished institution. However, you need supervision. This kind of people, they might not have time for you. Yeah. So you need someone who is hands-on and is, is, um, it, it also depends on the personality. That, of course, you will only find out once you are working with a person. But uh, my, the point I'm trying to uh, bring across is don't focus too much on rankings. Um, there is a university ranking in Germany, which is also according to departments and, and all kinds of criteria. But at PhD level, it, this is a different ballgame, in my opinion and in my experience. Other than when you start with a bachelor's or master's, that is different. But research, just look for the person who has the expertise that you need. 
I'll jump in there quickly just to mention um, we at your Access North America, we have a, a webinar series where we have a virtual coffee chat with a science diplomat, traditionally one of the, the top diplomats uh, that's posted to their embassy. And I know a different country, a country's embassy in another country doesn't necessarily always have a science diplomat. It's sort of newer in the last few decades. Um, and sometimes there's just not the budget for it for that. But the, the science counselor representing the entire EU delegation, so kind of even though it's not a country, the European Union is, is a diplomatic mission, uh, emphasize that exact same point that she got her start uh, doing research through funded research, um, continued to advance her career, and then eventually entered government service and civil service. Uh, but that for her, there was a lot of emphasis on rankings, and that can be de detrimental to your own search. Uh, that So I, I just want to underscore Anya's, Anya's comments and know that the, the feeling is is not hers alone, but common among many people within within the European Union. Science diplomat is the first time I hear of something like that. So we definitely don't have that person in Nairobi. <laughs> or or science attache or science counselor. The the terminology will will be different. But uh, never heard but of that. next next month we'll we'll uh, hope to interview the German science diplomat. So maybe maybe there okay. we'll we'll have some more insights. Okay, okay. Um so thank you. Um yeah, so th there's this question that I um someone is asking about if there are any joint uh, masters and PhD programs in Germany, and it can also extend to the whole of Europe. So if you want to um, take that question, whether there are any joint um, masters and PhD. Um, um, yes, there are, but there are few. And when it comes to funding, since I'm talking on behalf of a funding organization, um, we would not be in a position to fund at this uh, joint program. So we offer funding for masters and then separately for PhD. So um, yeah, that's my answer. Okay. The, uh, when someone asked about master's opportunities earlier, uh, I, I would give that same response about the Erasmus Mundus joint master degrees, because when I say joint, the, the other half of that is the expansion into a PhD. Um, yeah. So it's, that, that's where I would start. To, I'll, I'll respond to that person. So I think for the most part, thankfully, we've been able to answer almost every question here. Um, we'll, we'll try to close out making sure we address the few pending questions. Uh, and then I'm also just going to do a second review of the pre-registration questions to see um, if we can if we can answer those. I, I will jump in briefly and say a couple of those pre-registration questions uh, were asking about tests of English, um, English certification. And there isn't a pan-European single requirement. It really does differ on con country and university. But I would say for the ones that don't require a specific English uh, proficiency certification, it, it's some interview stage. The interviewer is making that determination as well. Um, so it, it's it's some level there is a, a check in that sense if, if you'll be doing your research in English. Uh, it's not always necessarily with an English proficiency test, although it, it is somewhat common. So the answer really varies in that case. Hmm. It's a, the, basically the same in Germany. So the universities are autonomous. So they choose what uh, they, they lay the requirements. So if um, if you see on a university's website that you have to submit a certain English proficiency test, then you have to keep in mind that this is an advertisement for people from all over the world. So if you happen to come from a country where English is a language of instruction from primary school or kindergarten to university, then I would suggest you um, write a short email to the course coordinator, uh, explain that you are from whatever, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, where this is the case, that English is a language of instruction, and inquire if in your case you also have to submit that, or if the fact that your certificates, your transcripts are all in English, um, your high school leaving certificate, whether that is sufficient or not. And then you have your answer. But as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to research in Germany, uh, particularly the pure research PhDs, this is conducted in English. You don't need to worry at all about it. Okay. Yeah. So, are there more questions? Um, if there's anything else you see, we can we can close out with any remaining questions, and then I would encourage people to follow up with me by email. Uh, again, many of my responses will be directing you to the national portals if, if you have an idea of the country you're in, uh, just because the country, the response varies country to country. Uh, but we, we hope you'll attend our future webinars as well. Um, 
including that virtual coffee chat series that I was I was sharing with Anya. Um, but in the meantime, I would encourage anyone to try to get their final questions in the chat. I'm again reviewing the pre-registration questions to see what information I might be able to share. Um, so Alex, yeah, please take it away if, if there's anything else you see. Um, I think um, for the most part, we've been able to um, get all the questions answered. Um, so we want to thank you all for joining this webinar. And if you're interested in reviewing the materials from today at a later date, your access, both your access and DAD will share a video recording and the presentation will be available online um, during the weekend. Um, you can also find the presentation from last week's um, um, webinar on France in a separate um, recording that will be shared in the follow-up email. We hope that this webinar will make your research or your search for research opportunities in Europe easier. And we thank you very much for um, the audience. And thank you. And um, yes. Thank you all. Look forward thank to being you. in touch. Bye. Take care. Thank you.